Welcome to AUPE's Labor in Motion Movie Club, where we screen the movies your boss doesn't want you to see. Our goal is to provide you a monthly film followed by a discussion night. The films we choose will feature worker struggles, unions, human rights, or democracy at work. We hope you gain an improved awareness about various working class issues and how they relate to your life here in Alberta. This is also the space where we can foster a deeper connection with AUPE and solidarity with fellow workers from across Alberta. Should be fun, so let's get started. I'm now going to introduce our guest speakers. Our first guest speaker is Abdul Malik. Abdul is a screenwriter and journalist who works at AUPE. He writes on the intersections of labor and sports for publications such as Jacobin and Canadian Dimension. Our second panelist is Emily Leadham. Emily is the Prairie Reporter for Press Progress, covering Manitoba and Saskatchewan. She's a former host of the Labor News podcast, Rank and File Radio, Prairie Edition, and former editor of rankandfile.ca. She was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, and attended the University of Calgary, where she was involved in feminist organizing and the Students' Union. She is currently based in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and has organized with the Fight for 15 and Fairness Movement. Welcome, Emily. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I love the film. I think it is a really great uh, popular education tool just because it, it goes through um, so many elements of how, you know, racism, sexism, um, these different kind of communities uh, have these internal conflicts and at the same time, they're trying to uh, fight this larger struggle against the, against the boss. And it wasn't too cheesy. It wasn't too preachy. It's still kind of, I to root it within the characters and, and find the emotional core within the characters. And uh, so I found it was uh, really well done, really effective. Its director described it as the first ever movie made of labor, by labor, for labor. Um, so many different people didn't want to be, uh, didn't want to let this movie be made. They thought it was too radical. They thought it was communist propaganda, right? The editor of this film, the first editor they had was actually paid by the FBI to quit um, editing the movie and they had to do all of the post-production in secret um, because they were afraid of things getting burned down. <laughs> they were afraid of the, the film sort of slowly getting lost, you know, lost. Uh, and it's worth, yeah, it's worth thinking about, you know, what made people so scared of it, right? Why was it blacklisted? Why did no one who worked on this film really ever work again? Um, and, and what purpose did, did it serve, right? And for who? Thanks so much. Uh, Jordan, uh, I'm gonna give you a chance to introduce one of our uh, guests who has a live question. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm gonna introduce um, one of our union sisters, Paulette Harrison, and Paulette's joining us tonight to pose a question. She has some comments. Hi, Paulette. Hi. Um, so basically my question is, is sort of two questions combined all together is, if this movie was done in our time now, how much different would it be, would it look like? Would the women be as involved or more involved? And the police, when they saw how many people there were, they backed off. Would that really happen now? Or would the police actually get more involved and actually put people in jail quicker? Um, I can answer that because when I was watching this, um, sort of immediately what came to mind was like, this is the uh, Unifor 594 strike at the co-op refinery in Regina, Saskatchewan that happened last year. There were so many parallels that I thought were really interesting. Um, when the miners got the injunction, for example, that said the miners can't um, pick it, that was on the injunction and the women said, oh, well, we can, the injunction doesn't bar us from doing it. Um, what Unifor did is they ended up flying in 400 Unifor members from across Canada um, because the injunction said no Unifor 594 members could pick it. Um, and then they were like, well, these are not Unifor 594 members, they're Unifor members. So they tried to find a loophole that way and they ended up um, blockading the refinery and the police did end up uh, coming in and it was like very unusual for recent Canadian history. Usually you don't see kind of police, police escalation like that. Um, 
but the president was arrested, uh, Jerry Dias was arrested, and a couple of the workers. Um, so that was really what resonated with me. Um, as for the women, um, I know that the women were quite involved. Um, well, there's there's women who worked at the refinery, but in terms of like the, the families um, of the workers, they were yeah they were quite quite involved in uh, in supporting. And you could see that in kind of the media sphere, there was someone who wrote a letter from a, a refinery worker's wife, sort of documenting how it was so hard seeing her husband go to work every day under these really dangerous conditions. That was another parallel is how dangerous it was to work at the refinery and know that he might have a shorter lifespan or he might be on long hours or on um, on holidays. So those are the parallels that jumped out for me. I think if uh, it's you bring up a really good point, Emily, about the co-op refinery, because my immediate instinct was that I thought if it were to be made today, by and large, the scale would be smaller. And I guess co-op is sort of the rebuke to that. Like I was thinking it would be, you know, small individual work sites or, you know, fast food organizing, or it wouldn't be as big as it is in the movie. And like, it would likely, you know, it would likely be led by women, actually. I mean, in the, in the service industry where you have, you know, a, a majority um, of workers in service industries and stuff like that are women. Um, and in, especially in service jobs like single mothers, right? Like, um, I would, I would expect that the nature and dynamics of power in this would be a lot, would be a lot more different if it happened today. But the one thing that's reliable, you know, from decade after decade is the involvement of police in curbing yeah. the labor, labor struggle, um, right? Uh, as Emily mentioned, you know, Jerry Diaz was arrested at, at the uniform picket line, like police have been used time after time, year after year as, you know, a sort of a weapon of capital and a weapon of the bosses um, and very rarely, if ever, uh, you know, will they ever sort of be in the camp for workers. Um, and, you know, that's something that that's remained consistent, uh, you know, from the beginning of the uh, North American labor movement all the way to the end of it. That, that was a really good point that you both brought up. And, and one interesting thing about the, the changing demographics of the labor movement is that by and large, the labor movement of today um, has a much larger percentage of women uh, as the members of the labor movement. It has been a been a huge shift over time, um, and uh, that's one of the, one of the big changes that we've seen. As especially as private sector um, uh, union certification has has been diminishing. Um, so, uh, uh, Jordan, do we have another question? We actually have a wonderful comment that's come in from one of our fellow workers, and I'm going to read the entire comment out loud. He says. Um, this movie showed me how things haven't changed, how the system is using the different institutions to repress not only the union, but also the people who depend on them. Today, we are still so far from the rest of the workers. Emily and uh, Abdul, any thoughts on that comment and how it related to the film? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I thought as well. Is there were just so many, so many parallels that you could, you could show it today, and um, like you, it, it would resonate with um, with struggles. Maybe not entirely, you know, but like you could pull pieces. Like, oh, this reminds me of you know this struggle. This reminds me of the refinery. This reminds me of like low wage worker organizing um, at Tim Hortons or something like that. So yeah, absolutely. And especially in industrial jobs, um, you know, we like to think that we don't have company towns anymore. We like to think that we don't have, um, you know, the same sort of ideas of like company script uh, or whatever. And, you know, we don't, but it's the same principles are there. They're just more well hidden. Um, you know, if you go to, and, and everyone here who's from Alberta obviously knows this, but you go to any of these communities that have been devastated by uh, coal withdrawal right or even places like Fort Mac and Grand Prairie where everything is so deeply reliant on the mechanisms of extraction that's you know it's not an argument to bring coal back or to look for energy alternatives it's an argument for workers to demand more and to demand that their livelihood is not tied 
into the whims of the bosses and their boss's desire to like maximize profit at the worker's expense, especially, and also at the expense of the planet. Um, you know, it, it's the idea of company towns um, really aside from maximizing profit are also to limit the imaginations of what workers can ask for and what workers think is possible. Getting paid real money, you were getting paid in vouchers and tokens um, to, so that you could only buy from the company, right? It was a way to create dependence on this company as, as not just a part of your working life, but as the main factor in every part of your life. Um, which is terrifying. But, you know, every couple of years we get uh, a news article that says, oh, Walmart has started paying out bonuses and gift cards, <laughs> Walmart gift cards and stuff like that, right? Like a lot of workers at places like Walmart who are obviously horrifically underpaid can only afford to shop at Walmart, right? Which is a really a drive to the bottom in terms of prices and exploitation. So yeah, like, and company towns were pervasive everywhere. Um, in Alberta, they were all over the pay, all over the place. Um, basically anywhere where there was a mining industry, um, I think farming industries as well, don't quote me on that. But yeah, basically single sector industrial towns were um, basically all company towns. And they remained that way for a really, really long time. And the labor, labor movement did a lot of good work to help push back against that and build meaningful alternatives that weren't company script, which you see in Salt of the Earth, actually. I'll just add that even though we might not have, you know, traditional company towns as depicted in this film, although, yeah, in, in many cases, we, we do in different locations, but they've evolved, they look different, or they're more hidden, right? And actually, in the Saskatchewan right now, there is um, there was a big debate in Regina over whether oil and gas companies should be able to sponsor public infrastructure. And the Regina City Council was trying to say that, you know, uh, oil and gas companies couldn't sponsor public infrastructure because we need to find alternate sources of funding to fund our services than relying on um, you know, the benevolence of oil and gas through donations, through um, sponsorships and things like that. And the CCPA, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, put out a really interesting report highlighting how philanthropy in Saskatchewan in small towns by the oil and gas industry fills in the gap for a lot of communities that are underfunded by the government. So they don't have adequate um, like uh, fire services, for example. So the local uh, company will step in and fund the, the fire services properly and provide all these other um, services there. So when you decide to kind of criticize them, they go, oh, look how much we've done for your community. Uh, why are you criticizing us? Um, as opposed to questioning why they have that much power in the first place over what gets funded and what doesn't. You see this in cities all the time in terms of public health and community programs as well. Um, if you know, if you threaten to, to harm a company, it's like, oh, well, your kid loves going to our, you know, company sponsored soccer, like loves playing in our company sponsored soccer league, right? Or, you know, we sponsor the hockey team or we sponsor these like recreation programs. Um, and those are always, you know, sort of the things they hold over cities because cities are either unable or unwilling or not accountable enough to provide those services um, on their own. After watching the movie, I decided to do a little bit of research on it. I was quite surprised by the fact that many people involved in the movie were accused of being part of the communism movement in the United States. And many of them suffered in terms of their careers because of, of the accusations. In fact, the lead actress, Rosera, uh, was deported before the movie was completed on an alleged passport violation. And she never filmed in the USA again, even though she was considered to be a movie star in Mexico. Can, can you shed some light into why a movie in the early 1950s being made about suppressed workers, suppressed women, and suppressed BIPOCs would be considered part of the communist mov movement? Because solidarity amongst those people presented a clear and present threat to capital um, and, you know, the U.S. or rather, you know, capitalism obviously views, viewed communism as sort of an existential threat to itself, um, you know, for very obvious reasons. 
Uh, but because of that, because of those red scare politics, because of this idea of, of existential annihilation, uh, it became a very useful weapon in suppressing labor because anything you don't like, you could call it communist and get people on board with. Um, and that included, and you still see it to this day, um, right? So you still see it with, you know, people calling, like the Democratic Party is the furthest thing from, from communist or in a lot of ways like pro-worker you know, in the US as a party could be aside from the Republican Party. But, you know, it people love to tar it with the brush of, of communism because they know it has that effect. Um, and, you know, yes, there were communists in the, in the mill workers, the mine workers who funded this film. Um, what were they fighting for? They were fighting for labor emancipation, right? They weren't fighting for communism when they were working with the union, they were fighting for ultimately workers' rights. Um, and it was those kinds of facets of radical organizing and this idea of like, you know, taking these people, repressing their speech and kicking them out of the labor movement um, because they were looking for, for emancipation that uh, that made it so dangerous. We have another question that's come in from one of our union sisters and I'll just pose it on her behalf. Tina writes, I was affected by the harshness and abusive actions taken like actually hitting a woman with the car and putting the children in prison. Is using force and intimidation an ongoing problem? That was one thing that really jumped out at me was the car because uh, I think in the, over the past year, we've seen some really um, well-publicized cases of that happening, whether it was, you know, well, in the refinery strike, you had truckers joking online about running over the picketers. Um, you have during the um, indigenous uh, blockades, um, you had some instances of people running into uh, some blockades there. And it's this really, yeah, it's this really like, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely still a huge, a huge concern that people think that they can take the law or something into their own hands, that they get so upset that these workers are fighting for something um, and that offends them so much that they need to do something about it themselves. Um, and you see politicians kind of egging this behavior on because then if the community members are doing it, they can say, you know, oh, the community's upset and they kind of uh, can protect themselves from seeming too heavy handed and they can let the um, general population kind of speak for them, I guess, in justifying breaking a strike or, or making it more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> It's, and, and, you know, when it comes to any labor, uh, any workplace or any labor movement, you know, um, women and people of color often get the worst of, of, you know, the crackdown by both the bosses and by the state. Um, you know, it's almost taken for granted because in the workplace, those are the people who, is, who are seen as the most subdominant, the most compliant, the most easy to take advantage of. Um, and when they don't, people get mad. Right, and I'm sure everyone who's watching this, everyone who has seen this happen in their own workplace, or you know, a woman who's uh, or or you know, person of color or both, right, um, stands up for themselves, and you know, the the boss or or someone you know higher up takes like a really keen offense to that, or has like an outsized reaction to that because you know they're just so. Yeah, the idea that the person they're able to take advantage of the most deeply is turning against them is something that, that people in power actually cannot abide and have never been able to abide. Um, David writes the following, if people were to participate in a labor strike today, would there be the same reprisals as there were with those who participated in the making of this film? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the like labor, um, labor leaders and, and ringleaders and um, you know, the, the people who are stirring up trouble, they get targeted by employers all the time and, and singled out and um, made of as an example. And so that is a very real, real concern. Um, whether it, it can be equivalent to something like McCarthyism or the red, or the you know, red scare, I'm not sure because that was a very, 
um, it's a huge cultural, cultural moment. One of the things I want everyone to think about, I don't know how many people here watch things like um, Law and Order, right? But like, you know, when you think of people like Bill Gates, billionaires like Bill Gates who have vendettas against, um, against teachers unions, right? Um, and has the Gates Foundation, which, you know, you could say has a lot of good work, but then, you know, they team up with a company like Viacom, which enables the Gates Foundation to have input into programs like Law and Order to put in plots about why teachers unions are bad as a function of the crime of the week, um, right? Like we don't even realize uh, the ways in which uh, billionaires and people who hate unions, um, you know, in, infest our media ecosystem and quietly plant this thing in our brain that's like, oh yeah, teachers unions do protect bad teachers, that's awful right? Like, like it's, it's a five-step process from Bill Gates to that Law and Order episode, but millions of people watch it and don't know about that connection, right? Which is very clear and, you know, very out in the open. And, you know, just to add to that, um, you know, the most similar organizing to labor rights organizing happening right now is tenants' rights organizing. Um, and especially in this, in this pandemic, you know, we've seen tenants' rights uh, take on a whole new sense of urgency, um, you know, because of the mass evictions we're seeing everywhere, including Alberta, which fortunately has not been reported on uh, at all. Uh, that should tell us something about the way the media is complicit in these things happening. Um, you know, but a great way to organize your community when you're not organizing at your workplace or if you're working from home, right, and you, you're having trouble organizing your workplaces, get involved with the tenants rights organization. The two feed into each other. And you know, a good tenants rights movement will create organizers in any workplace and vice versa. Um, and it's important to make sure that those community based organizing that is radical, that is labor oriented like tenants rights feeds into the labor movement and back and forth. And I'll turn it over to Jordan. Um, Brennan writes the following question. It was interesting to me to see the family as an economic unit represented in the film. I saw themes of the hidden value and the necessity of work that happens in our homes. I'd be interested to hear from the panel about how labor today might or might not take this into account, especially as the definition of family has changed so much with a question mark. Yeah, that's something that stood out to me as well. As a um, feminist organizer, I got my start in community organizing and, and politics, whatever, uh, feminist organizing on, on campus. And one thing that is so interesting is that labor, labor history has been erased from the feminist movement right now in, in general. There's such a focus on the women as an individual, as someone who needs to be um, empowered and following the beat of her own drum and you know starting her own business or working her way to the top um, that's the focus that's the predominant focus of mainstream feminism right now and um, it ignores like you said the focus on the family unit how that impacts um, women's um, you know, women's advancement, the better uh, like working conditions and, and just living conditions for women in general. Um, it really atomizes women um, and isolates them. What I really enjoyed about this film was how it showed the couple as um, building solidarity together um, and overcoming that sort of gender uh, tension and that those gender roles that they're kind of pushed into they learn how to break free of them because they have to, they simply have to in order to join together and fight in this larger struggle. So I thought that was really great. I, I agree. And I think it's, it also isolates the ways in which uh, domestic labor and women's work is extremely valid work. Uh, you know, like I personally am of the opinion that it should be you know, compensated the same way we compensate any other work. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is where the men are washing clothes, you know, and they say, 
you know, we, we, we needed to have the hot water in our contract, right? And they're like understanding the, the difficulty of like domestic labor and stuff like that. I think that that is, um, you know, it's something that we still overlook in our own conceptions of um, how we how we look at labor and, and interpret what the idea of labor is, right? And let's be honest, labor activists do it too, right? Like it's, it's an issue that often starts with us uh, and how we relate to our work versus like how our domestic partners or the people who take care of our kids, you know, relate to that work. Also just quickly add, um, I thought it was really important the way the film noted that um, gender roles are largely enforced by the economic situation. Um, and that if you wanna break free of them, it's not simply a matter of changing your mindset or reading certain books and making certain specific decisions like you have agency and you can choose to do certain things if you want but if you are in a position where you know the only jobs available to you are these um you know public sector jobs or cleaning jobs or jobs that are deemed as women's work and are paid less um you need to organize to better conditions um, you can't just simply choose like oh I'm not gonna be a traditional woman I'm gonna do something different it's not that straightforward and I really think that the feminist movement could do with um, focusing on on those organizing tactics and strategies that we saw really brought equality in this film um, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, democracy and gender dynamics in in the in the labor movement the fact that we aren't seeing this engagement in the community, like we said, um, it's really, really hard to do. Um, it shows that I think a lot of the labor movement is, is disconnected from its workers and disconnected from, well, yeah, I should say like labor, labor bureaucracy or however you want to frame it. Um, there's not that there's not that engagement with the workers and there's not that engagement with the broader community and I think um, like our guest pointed out earlier that's why we're seeing such stagnation and we're not as effective as we could be because it's we're, we're isolated and um, there's not that knowledge about what the labor movement is about, what unionism is about. And so people just don't understand it. And so they're not, they're not engaged. Um, so I think popular education is really crucial in encouraging democracy within the labor movement and within union and education initiatives like this, um, I think are really great. And if something like this could be organized for um, you know, non-union members, um, I know people do events like that, but um, emphasizing to the broader community, people who might not be unionized, why a union matters, why it can be so powerful. Because I know growing up in Calgary, I didn't learn about the labor movement at all until I moved to Winnipeg. Um, I didn't, nobody talked about it there. And if people did, it was in like negative tone. I didn't learn anything about the labor movement. Um, so I think that's a real, issue and i think that labor could be doing a lot more to engage the broader community i think um i think additional to that it also starts within your own labor movement you know you are aupe members aupe uh is an organization that prides itself on having uh vps who are women right having women as local chairs but also um sort of considering uh, considering, you know, your own relationship to that in meetings and, you know, in your, in your council meetings, in your local meetings and your union meetings, like, you know, making sure that, you know, that there's space to be made for um, women to speak and to make sure that, you know, everyone's acting in solidarity with each other to support people in the labor movement, especially, you know, again, like, immigrant women, people who have, who are, you know, maybe newcomers to the country or newcomers to the union who, you know, are still frightened um, or maybe intimidated by 
uh, you know, being part of, of a union or, or just by being here in the first place, right? Making sure that they're getting opportunities to speak and represent themselves. Um, because it's oftentimes it's very easy for, uh, you know, a trade union member to say, well, you know, the union president or vice president is a woman, you know, we, we're a progressive democratic labor organization. Of course, AUP is, uh, but that doesn't mean that every member doesn't need to keep working to make sure it stays that way and, and iterate and improve on it. We do have an interesting comment that I'd share. It goes back to our conversation earlier about strikes and the impacts or suppression of striking tactics. Um, one of our fellow workers, Andrea writes, uh, just a comment, in 1976 in Winnipeg at Griffin Steel Strike, myself and another picketer were being run over by a pickup. And as the front wheel was about to run us over, I heard the sergeant say, arrest those two. And we were arrested for obstructing the pickup. The charges were to be heard in court about a year later, but the charges were dropped a day before court because the rookie cop who arrested me unknowingly confessed to a friend of mine when they were both at a wedding that we shouldn't have been arrested. He said he would say this in court too. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that story, Andrea. I should have uh, invited you to tell it to us live. Maybe next time you can be one of the people who pose a, a live question. Um, we do have two other questions that might be a good way for us to kind of wrap up tonight. Um, Emily and Abdul, the questions are as follows. Do you agree with the ending of the movie or should it have ended differently? Related to that question, another one was, was there some things that happened in the movie that you think should have been done differently? So whether the ending or some other part of the movie, was there something that you would have done differently if you'd been the filmmaker? The two things, I'll answer both those questions at once just to make it easier. Um, I like the end of the movie. I think that even if you, and you know, they win, but even if you lose a strike, right, you still gain a lot. Um, you know, you're, you arguably do your best learning through loss than through victory, uh, and it makes the victory sweeter. Um, and, you know, ultimately you should be winning so much, the victories almost feel incidental and only the losses seem, uh, you know, uncommon or extraordinary, right? Um, <clears throat> in terms of what the film should have, I don't know if any of the characters should have done things differently. It is very much a labor fairy tale. Um, in terms of how it how it shows the struggle of workers. Um, but because it is a labor fairy tale, it presents this idealized version of the broader labor movement. You know, other workers coming to support them, other unions coming to support them. And like, you know, the union that funded this movie was kicked out of the AFL-CIO for being too radical. Um, and that's something I would have liked to see in the movie is the sort of tension within the labor union and the difference between rank and file, labor power, uh, and the people up at the top, right? The, the way that, you know, real change happens at the rank and file, it happens from the bottom up. It, you know, never comes from the top down. Um, and in this world, everyone's a worker and everyone's equal, but also it would have been interesting and cool to have seen the ways that, that you know, these workers almost buck the AFL-CIO or their, you know, union leadership who, is telling them to be less radical or trying to like curtail or control their radicalism. I think the power of having something made by workers for workers is really evident. And you could really explore so much, like you could do a whole movie that was exploring these more political tensions within the union, the same way that we make, you know, political movies like, like TV shows like The West Wing or um, about presidential races or things like that. I think that there is a lot more education that could be done about those inter, uh, inter union and, and labor movement politics because that's a huge, huge part of it for sure. Um, as for one thing that I noted was at the end, she says that they didn't know that they won the strike, but they had felt like they won something really big, which was cohesion with their community. They had kind of um, overcome some of those like gender barriers, uh, those racial barriers. They had found like real solidarity and for them. That was the victory. And I found that that was really powerful. Um, and that kind of speaks to a line earlier in uh, the film as well, which was 
if we lose, we lose more than the strike. If we win, we win something bigger. Um, so just the very fact that they're able to uh, organize and find solidarity with, with each other, um, the strike is really a catalyst for that. And the, the wins that they may get might be insignificant, but the fact that they found that catalyst, that they found each other, that is the threat in itself. Because if you can win this, you can win more. And that's why employers will try to nip organizing right in the bud. Even though it's the smallest thing, you're like, why are they making such a big deal about this? That's why. It's not about that 10 cent raise. It's not about a tiny, tiny ask. It's because they don't want you to feel like you have any power. Um, so yeah, thank you both for that so much. I just want to, uh, before we kind of wrap up here, I want to turn it back to Emily and Abdul. Um, for some last words, and if you could tell us a little bit about where we can find your work and any other things that you want to share with us. So, uh, Emily? Sure, yeah, I'll just say thank you so much for having me. This was, uh, this was really fun. Um, I will, yeah, just recommend um, people uh, check out a book called Red State Revolt, which I think is really, really well done. It documents teacher strikes in three states that are known as red states. Um, so typically thought of as more conservative, um, maybe, uh, you know, people that you wouldn't expect to have these massive, massive strikes and massive, massive win. And these just happened, you know, a couple years ago. And um, yeah, just to know that there are stories like this happening every day all around us and we don't see them because the mainstream media doesn't really report them. So uh, you can check out Press Progress. Uh, we do labor reporting, rankandfile.ca. Um, you can check out uh, episodes of my podcast, um, which you can go back and, and listen to previous episodes and, and hear about some of the stuff that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, and there is a, a good podcast called Belabored that's based in the States um, that does kind of updates and interviews about labor, uh, labor stuff. Um, so just have to look a little bit for that information. Um, but I'm sure all of the wonderful AUPE staff members here have lots of resources because um, it really is energizing to hear about other people's struggles and it gives you hope for uh, your own. Yeah, you can find my work at AUPE um, because I work at AUPE and do all the education videos. Um, so, you know, if you've uh, ever sat through an education video and thought, gee, this is boring, um, blame me. Uh, but if you liked it, you know, you're welcome. Uh, but uh, additional to that, I also, you know, write about sports, uh, sports and labor politics specifically. Um, you can read Jacobin, you can read Canadian Dimension. My work shows up in both of those places pretty regularly. And it's about, yeah, labor organizing and the way that, that stuff like junior hockey leagues and the Canadian Football League um, exploit workers and what workers, uh, what athletes who are workers are doing to fight back. And if we're recommending books, I'm going to recommend a short book um, called Fictitious Capital, How Finance is Appropriating Our Future. Um, which is, it is extremely short and very easy to read, but um, I think every worker should read this book because it's, a, it's an excellent overview of the capitalist mechanisms that dictate our lives in ways that we don't even begin to understand. I'd like to make one last call to action or a challenge. Bring a friend. Next time, see if you can talk to a coworker, even a family member or a friend, a neighbor, and get them to attend with you. Um, the more people, the merrier. Please find a coworker. It's kind of an organizing challenge. Uh, get one person who's not yet involved. See if you can connect them to AUP through this event. And uh, big thanks to our panelists. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. We hope to see you all next month. Thanks so much.